John, welcome. Thank you. Um, it's it's an honor to be here. Um, um, so today we're gonna um, I'm gonna give you guys an update on spotted lanternfly in Pennsylvania. Um, first thing on the first slide that I just want to point out, uh, there are a lot of names on this slide. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and these are all people who, uh, groups who have been uh, uh, participating in research or work on spotted lanternfly in some way or another. Uh, those groups include the USDA, uh, Penn State University, Kutztown University, uh, the Pennsylvania Department of Con Conservation and Natural Resources, uh, and the Department of uh, Forest Service. Okay? Um, so, uh, whoops, sorry about that. Um, today we're going to uh, take a look um, and, and learn a little bit about the, the actual insect itself. That will include some background on, on the insect as well as uh, biology of the insect. And then we'll take a look at uh, the program that the, the Department of Agriculture is actually implementing in Pennsylvania. Um, spotted lanternfly, also known as Lycorma delicatula, is a plant hopper in the family Phlegoridae. Uh, there are about 129 genera and 696 species in the world. Only nine genera and 17 species are present in North America. And worldwide, Lycorma is represented by seven species. Uh, like most plant hoppers, Lycorma pierce the stems of plants or trees with their proboscis to feed. Uh, the spotted lanternfly is native to Asia and is found in China, Bangladesh, and Vietnam. It was introduced to Japan, South Korea, and in 2014, Pennsylvania. Um, I actually really like this map. It really highlights um, just how far away from its natural area that this insect showed up. Um, in South Korea, it is considered an invasive pest and impacts grapes and peaches. Um, uh, this actually is concerned to Pennsylvania because in addition to uh, uh, damaging grapes, it also poses a risk to orchards, uh, hardwood, and nursery industries. All of those industries um, are top ten in the country for Pennsylvania, so um, it, it poses a significant risk to uh, a lot of what we do here. In Pennsylvania, populations have been detected in managed grapes. Um, so far, that damage hasn't actually been from the actual feeding, but from uh, the, the, the waste from the adults. That waste is called honeydew. Uh, the honeydew is actually a very uh, sugary substance, and as they feed and excrete, it lands um, on, on grape leaves and things like that. And you can see that in this picture here. Uh, this leaf is actually covered with honeydew. Um, what happens is um, that honeydew uh, with all that sugar in it eventually gets moldy and then you have a, a significant mold problem running through your uh, uh, vineyard. Um, and um, I don't know if you're aware, but um, vineyards can only apply chemistry so late into a season. And as the adults um, are feeding late into the year, this is where uh, it poses a risk to, to, to uh, grapes. Um, as I mentioned earlier, Kutztown University is doing some great work. Um, one of the things that they've done is they've started to develop a list of host plants in Pennsylvania. Uh, what we've learned from their work so far is that um, early in their life, spotted lanternflies will make use of many plant species, but they do strongly prefer tree of heaven. Um, it's scientifically known as Melanthus altissima. Um, as the insects become adults, they feed almost exclusively on tree of heaven. We're not really sure why that is, but knowing that allows us to develop um, a, a plan to, to uh, eradicate them. Um, that list of host plants is available on a, a website from Penn State. That information is at the bottom of, of this slide. Um, if, if you guys want that information again later, I, I'm more than happy to provide it. Uh, knowing a little bit just about the background of the insect, now we're actually going to uh, go into more of the biology. Um, um, and we're going to start um, when eggs hatch. Uh, eggs uh, typically hatch in mid-May um, through uh, June. Um, um, starting in um, June through July, the, the first instars will actually molt and become second instars. Uh, molting again will happen mid-June through mid-July to to give third in stars, um, and then July through September you get fourth in stars, um, and that's when you start to see some of the distinctive red on them. 
Um, I can tell you that um, at that point, uh, when we start seeing fourth instars, is when we start seeing a significant uptick in calls to us from residents reporting that they've seen spotted land and fly. Um, Starting in, in uh, late July through December, adults are present. Um, adults do not overwinter, so after a few very hard uh, uh, frosts or very cold nights, the adults will die off. Um, egg laying occurs from um, October through November, and then those eggs um, are obviously um, found um, October through um, June of the following year when they begin to hatch. Um, egg masses on uh, have on average between 30 and 50 eggs and can be laid on trees and or any smooth surface. Um, something that's, uh, I, I, that is really important to point out is that in this left picture here, you'll see an egg mass in this section down here um, that is um, looking a little gray. This is actually what they cover all of their egg masses with. It's a, uh, a gray, waxy substance. Uh, it appears to give the eggs a little more protection. So oftentimes you, what you do not see are these black eggs, but you see something like this where it almost just looks like a piece of dirt, um, either on a tree or in this case on the underside of, of a stone. Egg masses have been found on many different objects and are often well hidden. Um, um, this makes our job very difficult. One of the things that we do um, um, as our survey teams are out is, is uh, we actually do egg mass scraping. So we look everywhere for egg masses. Unfortunately, for every egg mass that we find, we probably are missing 10. Um, and this just kind of shows some of the places that they will lay their eggs. This picture on the left, if you look in the back, you'll see a, a rusty 55-gallon drum just covered with egg masses all along the outside of it. Uh, and then there's this piece of wood in front of it that is also covered with egg masses. Uh, the middle picture here is showing, again, an egg mass just on a, a wooden post. Uh, there's uh, just something there to provide a, a reference to how big, or in this case small, the egg masses actually are. Um, they, you know, uh, we oftentimes have um, um, residents saying, I've been looking for them and I haven't been able to see them. When we show them an egg mass, they, only then do they realize how small they actually are. Uh, the picture on the right um, is, is showing uh, a tree with the bark peeled off and a bunch of egg masses on it. Uh, what we've noticed is that spotted lanternflies on trees that have bark that is peeling will actually climb down between the bark and the tree and lay their eggs in there. So that is also a challenge. Um, um, just make sure that we, we, as we are out doing our surveying, that we're looking for uh, eggs pretty much everywhere we can. Um, just some more pictures here. This middle picture is showing egg masses laid on the inside of a, a uh, metal U-post. And then uh, the one on the right, um, just on the other underside of a rock. So um, finding egg masses is challenging. Um, you know, we do see lots of them on the outside of trees, but like I said, um, they're basically going to lay their eggs anywhere and everywhere that they can, but they do prefer to hide them um, in well-protected areas. Uh, once the eggs hatch, uh, you have immatures. The immature stages migrate up and down trees each day. Uh, we're not really sure why they do that, um, but we, knowing that we can take advantage of that, and so one of the things that we have implemented last year and this year um, are the use of um, what we call brown paper bands. Um, it's similar to fly tape. Um, it's, it's just bands that we put around um, Atlantis. Uh, they have uh, sticky glue on them, so as the insects move up and down the trees, they get caught on that. Um, we actually service the bands every two weeks, so we are out at those trees every two weeks taking bands down, counting the number of insects of, that we've caught, recording that data, putting new bands up. Um, adults begin to appear in late summer. Um, again, they feed preferentially on Olanthus, uh, then they mate and lay eggs. In South Korea, females uh, lay eggs twice before dying. We're not sure um, if they do that here or not. Um, um, we do know from dissections that have been done in the lab that females have carried up to 150 eggs. So um, if you remember earlier, I said typical, typically egg masses consist of 30 to 50 eggs. Um, so it's possible that they could lay eggs up to three times, but we just haven't observed that. Uh, males and females mate multiple times. 
um, uh, adults and latent stars are rarely caught on on the on the sticky bands that I talked about earlier. Uh, the glue, unfortunately, they're strong enough to walk through the glue, um, and and this was something that was very frustrating to our survey crews as they were out looking at their bands with nothing on them and trees covered. So they took matters into their own hands and developed some uh, uh, unique ways of catching them. Uh, those methods are shown here on the, the middle picture and the right picture um, uh, um, in which they basically uh, use the, the, the sticky bands almost like a lint roller and just kind of go over the tree with it and, and get as many uh, lanternflies as they can. Uh, we have actually adopted that as a, a, a way to catch them. Uh, uh, we have done that again this year um, and it does seem to be an effective way of catching them. Um, the eradication program relies on cooperation. Um, in addition to all of the research that people are doing, um, we have a lot of local officials and state agencies and uh, the Penn State Cooperative Extension uh, that are all involved in leading uh, the organizational charge. Uh, uh, it's also uh, cooperation between um, our, our crews that are out doing the surveying of volunteers, uh, property owners, and businesses. Um, so uh, I didn't really talk a lot about it, but we do have a volunteer program in which we do give supplies to homeowners if they want to volunteer to band and report their, uh, the data from their property. Uh, that volunteer program is in its second year. Uh, last year we had about 20 people uh, banding their own property. This year we are up to 34. Um, through um, 2016, so this includes last year's data, uh, we've banded uh, 9,500 trees. We've killed a little over 500,000 um, spotted lanternflies on those bands. Uh, the egg mass scrapings that we've done uh, have, have resulted in 650,000 uh, spotted lanternflies being destroyed. Uh, uh, we've also investigated um, 874 public reports with an accuracy rate of seven almost 71%. What that means is uh, we have, um, uh, we receive phone calls and emails from people saying, I think I have spotted lanternfly. Every one of those calls that we get, we do investigate, um, and about uh, three quarters of those are actually accurate, which is um, really impressive. We typically don't see anything that comes close to those numbers. Uh, part, of, part of this uh, is probably accounted to just the fact that the insect is very recognizable. Um, um, you may have seen in the picture earlier where there were just um, uh, a tree covered with, with land and flies. It's a little hard to miss something like that when, you're, when you have a tree that looks like that. Um, so knowing a little bit about the biology, uh, we're going to take a look now um, at um, uh, the eradication method that the department has started, and that involves uh, Atlantis removal and trap tree setup. Um, and what that consists of um, is um, we select properties with the highest capture rate. That capture rate is based off those uh, sticky uh, bands that we use, um, 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 properties um, you know, we, we're checking those every two weeks, so as we get more data from those, we're able to look at that throughout the season and go, this property is a good candidate um, um, to, to have the work done on it. Once the property is selected, um, I meet with the owners, I issue them a treatment order. The treatment order outlines the work that we want to do, how we're going to do it, why we want to do it, um, and, and things like that. Um, after we get a signed treatment order, I have a survey team come out and, and walk the entire property uh, looking for uh, every single Atlantis on the property. Uh, we mark those Atlantis as either uh, trees that we're going to remove or trees that will be our trap trees. Uh, we do also have to determine where wetlands are on a property. We'll discuss that a little bit later. Um, so uh, most Atlantis are removed or killed with an herbicide. Um, um, if, if you're not familiar with Atlantis, if you just cut the tree down and do not treat it with an herbicide, it will grow back with a vengeance. Um, 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 you cut one down and, and 
five, ten more shoot up. Um, so it's, it's very invasive. Um, these pictures are actually showing some of the work that has been done. You'll see all of these stumps that have been painted uh, green. Those are tree, trees that we've cut down and have treated stumps with the herbicide. Um, if, if a tree is very small, we can do something called hack and squirt, uh, where it's basically a direct application of the herbicide to the tree. Um, any tree that we, uh, any ailanthus that we do not uh, uh, remove uh, are left as trap trees. Those trap trees are treated with a systemic insecticide, and within 24 hours, uh, the lycorma, within 24 hours of feeding, the lycorma uh, will will die. Uh, one added bonus of this, um, and this is something we thought we might see, but weren't really sure until it happened, is that. Um, um, these, these treatments have also been effective in um, uh, uh, taking out the immatures as well. Um, so it, it's providing much more of a, a, a throughout the season protection as opposed to late season protection. Uh, the impact on the adults is dramatic. Uh, you're looking at two pictures here of the same trap tree. Uh, the picture on the left just shows uh, lanternflies congregating on that tree and feeding on it. You'll notice um, some of the lanternflies where you can see uh, they're red un uh, underneath their wings. Those are insects that have fed on the trees and are actually dead and stuck to the trees. If you look on the right, you'll see just a, um, a ring of dead lanternflies around uh, the base of the tree. So um, it is something that we know that works. The results are very dramatic. Uh, I was out at a couple of properties that we've done uh, uh, not too long ago, um, and uh, there is literally a blanket of dead lanternflies under those trees. So uh, the results are very promising. Um, at this point, it's just getting more properties treated. Um, um, and that kind of leads into um, some of the, the finer details of property treatment. Um, through t um, October 25th, uh, we've treated 25 properties. If you look at the map on the right, uh, those property, or I'm sorry, the map on the left, uh, those properties are the ones that you see in red. Uh, the yellow properties, um, uh, those are properties that we have signed treatment orders for. Um, and there's a couple of properties that are very small that are orange colored in orange, uh, work is currently being done on those. So in total, we're probably at about 100 properties uh, that work has either been done on or it is um, uh, happening or will be happening. Um, but um, each property um, is unique and presents its own challenges. Aside from the fact that each property has a different amount of trees, uh, each property can have, uh, can have different requirements for tree removal. Um, uh, you know, you can have trees that are right next to a house or trees that are uh, right next to a power line. Um, oftentimes, we'll have to bring in a bucket truck to have those trees removed. Um, um, you can also have uh, properties that basically back up to a very steep slope and it's hard to get the equipment up there. Uh, all of these things um, um, do make each property its own challenge. Um, I, I alluded to it earlier, um, but wetlands are an issue at some sites. Um, uh, we are actually operating in an area with a couple of endangered species, one of them being the bog turtle. Um, uh, we, before we can do any work on a property, we actually have to uh, survey the property for wetlands and mark off where the wetlands are, so that way the contractors know where the uh, wetlands are. Uh, uh, the contractors are not allowed to drop any trees into uh, at, uh, wetlands. The uh, application of any chemistry has to be done completely different. Uh, it can't be, they can't be using backpack sprayers and things like that. Uh, they, they basically have to use paintbrushes and things like that to apply uh, the chemistry. Uh, we're, we're trying very hard to minimize our impact. Um, based on all of that, uh, the cost for removal can vary significantly per property. Uh, we're still in the early stages of this, um, and so um, we're still trying to uh, get a, a better idea uh, of what a, a true estimate is. Um, every time we do a property, um, you know, it, it either comes back a little higher than we thought or a little lower than we thought, um, and, and it, it makes budgeting um, um, uh, the work a little difficult right now. Uh, and, and now we'll just 
briefly go over some of the survey work that is happening in the state. Um, uh, the first map is just um, showing where we have surveyed. Green dots are negative for Lycorma, and red dots are positive for Lycorma. And what you can see is that um, really everything is clustered in southeastern Pennsylvania. Um, um, we've surveyed almost 7,500 sites across the state. That has been uh, that work has been done by um, our apiary inspectors, our plant inspectors, as well as additional agencies. Um, this this next slide, uh, we're just taking a look at a couple of things. Um, um, the map on the right is actually our delimitation survey results, um, and what you're looking at um, uh, is. Um, any square that you see is a one by one kilometer uh, grid. Um, if, if it is lit up as red, that means somewhere within that grid we have found at least one spotted lanternfly. Uh, if you see blue, that means um, our survey uh, uh, results so far, we have not found anything there. If you do not see any uh, uh, blue or red squares over an area, we have not been there yet. Um, um, through that work, we've been able to identify 703 properties that were infested. Uh, this does not include areas along highways and roads and things like that, um, but this is actually um, uh, private residents and businesses and things like that. Um, public reports aid in, in, in new detections. Oftentimes, it's either a single specimen or just a few, um, and, and that's really uh, what gets us out further and further to keep looking. Um, I, um, as it was mentioned earlier, um, I've only been on this project since July, um, but the amount of calls that we get um, from residents um, is um, phenomenal. I mean, I, there was a 24-hour period where we had uh, over 120 calls and emails reporting spotted land and fly. Um, so we are kept really busy investigating those reports. Uh, the biggest uh, threat to the spread of this insect so far seems to be hitchhiking. Um, if you look on, at the delimitation map, you'll see a single red square down here in Chester County. Uh, that was a single um, um, uh, report. We went down there. Um, uh, we found some lanternflies. We actually did um, the control work down there. Uh, we killed all the lanternflies that we could. Um, you'll see it in, in uh, one of the upcoming slides, but we have actually not found any spotted lanternflies down there. Uh, unfortunately, there is a significant uh, uh, highway that runs basically from the quarantine area south through uh, the area that this was picked up. Um, additionally, um, as this insect has moved uh, north and east towards um, Allentown. In those areas, there's a lot more uh, traffic going up that way. Uh, there's um, a, a couple of interstates and, and major highways that run through there. Uh, we have been heavily surveying those areas, um, uh, and so far our results haven't turned up anything in, in those areas. Um, this is a heat map um, just uh, showing um, on, on the left-hand side here, the, the results from 2015, um, and again on 2016. A couple of things that I'd like to point out um, um, is that, one, it, it really does reinforce um, a central point of introduction. Um, um, the, the results for 2016 so far are only through July. Um, this map has unfortunately not been updated since then, um, but we hope to actually have a new uh, updated one for this soon. Uh, the other thing um, that that is important to show is that while our quarantine has expanded, oftentimes um, it's single specimens or very low numbers. Uh, what we're finding outside of the quarantine, um, on the outer edges of the quarantine, are kind of represented here with um, very low numbers. The last thing is that um, this was the site in Chester County that I referenced last year. If you'll see this year surveying, we have not found anything. So um, that is very encouraging to us. Um, uh, the last uh, thing that we're going to take a look at here, this is uh, the most current quarantine uh, map that we have produced. Uh, it covers 31 townships in five counties. Um, it is very similar to the gypsy moth quarantine um, in that we are not quarantine quarantining whole counties at a time, uh, but taking an 
a, a, a township by township approach um, and uh, to uh, try to put limit the spread of this and and, and um, work uh, with the quarantine being in effect uh, we we've actually requested that citizens uh, just do a self check uh, anytime they're leaving the quarantine you know check your vehicles um, check your your bags uh, we asked residents don't park their vehicles under trees um, things like that uh, we've, we've gotten that message out numerous ways we've had mailings go out to people um, uh, Penn State has an extension uh, in which they provide uh, that material to people uh, local townships um, have um, uh, the same material that they are giving out to people. So we're trying to get that information out to uh, the public as, as much as we can and constantly reinforce that message to them. Um, businesses are operating under a compliance agreement. Uh, we're not trying to, to shut down anyone. We, we do understand uh, that, that these businesses do have work that needs to be done. Um, the compliance agreements um, basically um, are agreements between uh, the business and the Department of Agriculture um, in which they agree um, um, to either take the responsibility of checking everything before it leaves uh, the proper, their property. Um, if they don't want that responsibility, we actually have one of our plant inspectors come out and check everything before it leaves. Um, we're trying, like I said, we're trying to do everything we can to keep this from getting too far away from uh, where it's currently at. Um, so at that point, um, that's everything uh, that I have. Um, if, if you have any questions.